you are going to watch on this edition of Connected Farmer uh, the trends of cover crops in the United States and Brazil. For the American part, we are going to have Keef Burns, and for the Brazilian part, Admir Calegari from the Agronomic Institute of Paraná. Right here on Connected Farmer, your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe. So we start with uh, some trends in the United States. I would like to ask uh, Keith Burns from Green Cover Crops uh, if uh, how what were the trends regarding cover crops in the U.S. Uh, during the last year? Varied. Um, we we saw a lot of different things. Of course, with COVID, you know, it really it was a crazy year. So it's it's a little bit hard. As a general rule, what we saw is we saw more people ordering seed, but the average order was smaller. And, and so we saw more interest, uh, but, you know, with, with uncertain economic times, with, uh, you know, for the most of the year, commodity prices were quite low, so everybody's budget was pretty tight. Um, everybody was kind of cutting back and, and ordering, you know, less seed on average. Uh, but the interest is still there, and we feel like, you know, that demand will will grow uh, because we saw the number of people who were interested grow. We probably got hurt as far as cover crops getting out as much in the second half of the year because there's a pretty widespread drought, uh, particularly, you know, where I'm right in the middle of the United States, right in central Nebraska, and, and from, from me, west and for me south there's there's a lot of areas that are pretty dry and so that drought really uh, hurt people from uh, planting as much as they maybe would have in a normal year yes and in the middle of the year the commodity prices have rebounded so that has helped you it has. We're, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest right now. I mentioned before that we were extremely cold, uh, you know, two and a half weeks ago. We had the coldest weather, you know, recorded in my lifetime here in Nebraska. Uh, and, and now it's 70 degrees. You know, so, so it feels great. So you know, there's a lot of interest right now. A lot of people are calling. Uh, we are expecting to have some pretty good interest uh, in the spring planted cover crops. Uh, simply because a lot of people used up a lot of their hay because it was so cold and, and a lot of snow in a lot of places. So hay is extremely expensive right now. And so we, we're seeing a lot of interest in planting, you know, oats and barley and triticale along with some peas uh, to try to get a forage crop, uh, a hay crop harvested. And, and then they, you know, if they have enough moisture, they may still come in and plant soybeans after that. Or if they feel like they're a little limited or that takes a little longer than what they wanted, they may come in and plant sorghum sedan and cow peas and millet and things like that uh, for a second hay crop or a, or a forage crop to be grazed after that. And with those crops changing, uh, what are the new questions that you are getting there? Um, you know, the new questions, you know, a lot of it, uh, again, is just, you know, how, if I plant this for hay, you know, when could I harvest it? Can I still plant something else behind it? You know, a lot of questions like that. Um, you know, some questions revolving around, you know, the economics of does that make sense versus, you know, you know, corn and soybeans are, you know, commodity prices have rebounded and they're, you know, have pretty good value right now. And so, you know, there's just a lot of decisions of trying to, you know, figure out what is going to make the most economic sense. But for the cattle guys, you know, if you have to go out and buy hay, it, it probably makes sense to take some acres and try to grow some of that yourself. If you don't have cattle and you're just kind of speculating on that market, you know, trying to hit a, a high market on hay, eh, you know, it may or may not be. That's probably a little riskier. Because uh, you still have to get that hay sold and hauled and, you know, put up properly and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, we're seeing some questions there. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more interest also 
Uh, we have a lot more questions coming about people wanting to plant something in their corn at B3 or B4, you know, the interseeding type thing. And so there's a lot of questions coming in about, you know, what species would work well to be planted at that, uh, at that time. And, and even, you know, there's been some people experimenting with wider row corn instead of planting corn on, on you know, 30 inch centers, there's, they're planting corn on 60 inch. So they have a wider corridor to plant the cover crops in. And I, nobody's really doing that on a large scale, but there's more and more people that are kind of dabbling with that and experimenting with it. Again, especially the guys with livestock, because you can grow a tremendous amount of cover crop biomass in between a 60 inch row of corn that you can never do in a 30 inch row. Yeah, and I, I just uh, learned about uh, a plan from the new administration in the, in the U.S. that they would be rewarding those farmers that uh, plant uh, cover crops. What's your opinion about this and your approach? Yeah, you know, right now it's it's still just you know, kind of a lot of talk and, you know, talk from politicians is pretty cheap until it actually happens. Uh, but there is a tremendous amount of interest in, in carbon sequestration programs. Uh, you know, just within the last six months, there's been, you know, probably four or five new carbon programs that have come out on the market. And a lot of them are coming out from, from the, the big ag companies, uh, Bayer, Nutrien, uh, Syngenta, Land O'Lakes, you know, some of the big, the big co-ops are starting to offer some of these carbon programs in addition to, you know, the Indigos and Noris that have been on the market for a little while. So there's lots of choices, uh, which is good, but it's also kind of confusing sometimes to know, you know, which, which one of these different programs could be best for me. So there's a lot of interest around that. We have, uh, we've had a lot of questions and, you know, we don't necessarily know those answers. On our own farm, we haven't necessarily signed our acres up for any of the programs yet. We're still kind of waiting to see how they develop and, and waiting to see what the different options will be. So I think with the new administration, there, there, there will be more favorable towards carbon programs. Uh, there will be more incentives for doing some of these things. Uh, but it's it's way too early to really know what those incentives are going to be, how they're going to be administered, who is going to qualify, and then finally what you're going to have to do if you want to get paid. So I, I think there's there's a, kind of some guarded uh, optimism around that, you know, that there will be some some additional programs that will further soil health. But until we see the details of how that's going to be played out, I, I think everybody's kind of remaining a little guarded on it. Okay. Ademir, uh, feel free yes. to join the conversation. If you've got any question about cover crops in the U.S., throw them out to, to Keith. For sure, of course. It's a pleasure, Keith. And also our friends, Ray Ashweta, Gay Brown, and many others going back, and many famous scientists, Don Rekoski and others. And please, Keith, how is it going on, the cover crops in general? They are increasing the area. They are using more species. How is the mixing cover crops in different uh, uh, possibilities or before soybean or like you said, intercrop of maize or some uh, vegetable crops in rotation or with some fruit crops or for silage or for ray as well for use as, as for grazing? Yeah, you know, there, there's just so many different sectors. It's, it's a little hard to pin that down. I would say as a general rule, um, the people who are planting cover crops in a, in a window of time frame where you can plant a lot of diversity. So when they're coming in after a summer harvested, you know, wheat or rye or barley or something like that, uh, I would say that those people are increasing the amount of diversity that they're putting out there. You know, instead of just doing sorghum or maybe sorghum and cow peas, you know, we'll, we'll maybe get them to do a six way, eight way, 10 way blend, especially if they're grazing. If they want to put hay up, you know, it's, it's a little harder to be quite as diverse, but if they're going to graze something like that, uh, there's, there's really good interest in, in expanding that diversity in that scenario and that option. Um, you know, when it comes, you know, a lot, so many of the acres, they're kind of trapped in this corn and soybean rotation. And in much of our country, you know, by the time they harvest the corn and the soybeans, you know, it's already frozen. There's just, there's no growing season left. 
So, so those guys just don't have a lot of options for diversity. You know, we're using a lot of cereal rye, uh, a lot of hairy vetch because, you know, those are going to be very cold tolerant and will survive the winters. So we see a lot of that. But as I was mentioning earlier, you know, there's some pretty creative thinking going on out there about how can we get that diversity still into the system? One of the answers is to try to get it planted before you harvest the corn. And so, you know, of course, people try flying it on, you know, you know, before black layer, you know, between tassel and black layer. But more and more people are experimenting with with trying to get it planted in between the corn rows, you know, when that corn is at V3, V4, somewhere in there. And, and that's meeting with mixed results. Uh, some places it works better than others, some years better than others. Typically, what we see, the further north you go in our country, the better it tends to work because their, their days are longer during the summer, but their summers are shorter. So those cover crops don't have to survive under that dense uh, shade canopy of the corn for quite as long. And so it does tend to work a little better. Plus they really run out of growing season at, you know, by the time they harvest. So it's important for them to try to get that established. So we're seeing more interest in that. And, and, and then when you do that, you can get some of those species in that you would never be able to plant if you truly waited until after harvest. So I, I think for the most part, you know, more and more people are understanding the power of diversity. It's, it's just that the, with the rotations that we have in a lot of acres, it, it's just not practical to do if we're waiting until after harvest to plant. Good, excellent. So uh, one question is, what about the over-sowing? Is it become more common? For example, do we understand the, before harvesting soybean, for example, they are over-sowing some oat or buckwheat or whatever uh, two, three weeks before, or maybe also over the maize or sorghum. It is common, the over-sowing. When you harvest, you have this implanted crop that is growing. I, I would say that is becoming more and more popular, especially as you go east where there's more moisture or under irrigation, like right where, right here where we're at, um, on the dry land acres, that's pretty risky because we can put that seed out there and then we, we just don't get a rain to get it up and going. Mm -hmm. um, there's more and more uh, of the high boy seeding equipment, you know, where they can go in with a row crop machine that's really tall clearance and, and they drop the seed underneath the leaf canopy of the corn with drop tubes. And so that way you're not getting any of the seed caught up in the leaf whirl of the corn. Uh, that, that seems to be more popular as well as opposed to an airplane because you're getting the seed to the ground and not getting caught up. What we have seen, and, and I don't know if this is necessarily true or not, this is what we have observed on our own farm when we've experimented with this. We've had the, had the high boy machine come in and you know drop the cover crop seed uh, in the corn. Uh, and then we, you know, we can irrigate that up. We get a pretty good stand initially. And, and uh, then every time we went out and looked at it, it got worse and worse and worse. And, and before long, we couldn't find anything. And I think what is happening, you know, on our soil that, you know, has been no-tilled for more than 30 years, and we've been doing cover crops for 12 years, there's, there's so much biological activity. You know, there were just, you know, millions of crickets out there. We think that we're getting a lot of insect feeding on both on the seed and on that little seedling uh, because there's really nothing else green, you know, green and tender down at that level, you know, because this, this would be into September for us, you know, several weeks before harvest. And so they're just really attacking that to the point where, you know, there's just not much left. Um, but in, in soils that are not in as good a shape. There's more bare ground. Uh, there's far less insect activity, less biological activity. It seems to work quite a bit better because again, we're getting seed to soil contact because it's falling on bare soil. And then once that starts growing, you know, they don't have the, the crickets and the beetles and all of those things out there uh, to be eating both the seed and the seedlings. And so it I don't know. That's that's just one observation. It's I don't. I'm not saying that's what's happening everywhere. We think that's what happened on our farm, uh, and it may be happening in other places as well. But but certainly we've seen that type of system work better in some scenarios than others. So in the old rotation, or some do you have some? For example, together with the 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 breadth of the cover crops. You have some, for example, for a long time, you said 30 years or more in no-till. 
to have some strong challenges, like, for example, uh, increased nematode population or some soil compaction or some root disease that are increasing, you put something or what is the approach for this together with the, the cover crops is to manage this system in general. Yeah, we're not really seeing that on, on our acres, but you know, we probably have a more diverse rotation than most because you know we can grow rye and triticale and barley and buckwheat and sunflowers, things like that. And you know, we we sell that through our through our cover crop seed business. Uh, for the people that are more in a corn soybean only rotation and that's all they grow, uh, there there are there are more reports of soybean cyst nematode, you know, corn nematodes. There certainly are more, you know, pest pressures building up. Uh, and I think it would be very beneficial, you know, for them to rotate out to wheat and then a, a big full season cover crop for a year. You know, but you know, from an economic standpoint, most people don't really think that's viable. Uh, if you have cattle, you know, I've had some guys that have grown corn for 20 years in a row on a field and they know that they're losing productivity because it's just corn after corn after corn. Well, when they, when they switch that out and they go to a full season of grazing cover crops, cause they've got a lot of cattle, um, you know, they say when they come back in to corn, then after that, it's, it's just night and day difference. You know, it's, it's that even just that one year of doing a cool season cover crop mix, grazing it down, doing a warm season cover crop mix, grazing it down, uh, really makes a big difference in breaking some of those pest cycles and starting to get some organic matter put back into the soil and things like that. So, so we're not seeing those issues on our own ground necessarily, uh, but certainly others are. And, and I think that, you know, there hasn't been a, a lot of research done yet on, you know, cover crops and how they uh, are affecting, you know, like soybean cyst nematode, but I think there'll be more research done. Uh, but certainly even just having a rye cover crop, you know, can make a big difference. Good. Ademir, uh, I would like uh, you to tell us a little bit uh, how, which were the experiments that uh, you have done in Brazil throughout 2020. Uh, I remember we we did a special program with uh, a producer that uh, had uh, record use. But uh, tell us a little bit more, what have you been doing throughout last year? Yeah, we have accompanied many farmers in, the, 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 in different places, different states. This uh, last season was a little bit too the confused we have some area with dry season another uh, a lot of rainfall we have some farmers that are just losing some soybean uh, the problem with the the harvesting and another is is a good condition this, this is also for bean for other crops so you have the different uh, uh, position but what we are seeing mainly this year is that that places that you are for more long time doing a more properly the rotation and also in this condition, we are using mixed cover crops in generally four or five, six or seven different species. And also some we are using, uh, Keith, uh, is uh, increasing a lot the oversawing in maize. So when maize is six or eight uh, uh, part of, of leaves is around 40, 60 centimeters. We spread this, we over uh, broadcast the seeds uh, by tractor or by plane in different seeds like radish, like a crumby, like buckwheat. It is, is, is very common and also finger millet, we, we, we got to wonderful results. So when you harvested this maize, this maize will close normally 45 centimeters between rows. And this cover the soil, this have a mix, very nice, wonderful results on all uh, chemical, physical, and also biological properties, attributes. And this is our, our improving a lot our system. So we have farmers that uh, that farmers that are doing more properly in this year were achieving very, very nice uh, uh, soybean grain yield. We have some farmers that achieved, achieved uh, we say, 104 bags. This means uh, six ton, uh, 6.2 tons per hectare of grain soybean. So it's quite a lot in a good price. So the farmer are very very, very happy. Also some farm activity, 10, 11, 12, 14 tons of maize. So what they're showing for us is when you, you achieve this equilibrium, because the nematodes here in our condition, mainly a tropical, a subtropical condition is very strong. 
So you have three different big challenges for us, for annual crops. Mainly soybeans, we have 32, 33 million hectares. So, and also for corn mainly, is the, the three points is nematode, infection of population, we have the soil compaction and also the root disease. So this is the three big challenges for us. So normally in general, the farmers that are using cover crop is not enough to achieve all of this. So you need to complement, and this we are increasing quite a lot here, is big companies, some in own farm, are producing microorganisms or are producing in applying. So bacillus, bacillus, oconia, different fungi, uh, metarhizum and trichoderma. So the results are wonderful, are fantastic results are achieving in order to decrease nematodes, also to improve with the soil and plant bioactivation to improve the natural enemies. And this also decreasing this problem, this, these challenges, and also some special chop roots, cover crops are increasing the, the, the crop yield and are putting our, our no-till in a good shape. So many farmers are doing what we're seeing, different place. You have also some area, for example, Minas Gerais, we are working with the coffee plantation areas, farmers. So we are mixing four, five, six cover crops. For, for example, some flour, uh, pear millet, uh, finger millet, uh, buckwheat, uh, oat, uh, field pea. We are putting different species, four, five, six, is are increasing four, five, six bags. This means 360 kilos per hectare of, uh, of uh, coffee grain uh, yield. So this means uh, quite a lot of money for this uh, medium and, and small scale farmer, mainly on the coffee, also some large scale. So the use of, of cover crops in rotate with the, the, the hort orchard crops, the tomato, potato, uh, garlic, uh, barley, uh, barley, no, garlic in, 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 uh, in onion, uh, is, uh, carrots are wonderful. So when you put this and also if you mix with the, the, the orange trees in the coffee are increasing a lot of the all uh, the, the, the quality of the soil, all the, 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 the yields, and also re returning to equilibrium that was in the past. What I see is that the many farmers that are putting the biological approach now, using plants, using biological products, or increasing on applying this biological and also bioactivation, are doing better, are increasing quite a lot. We have some farmers that start with, uh, I can say, 3.3, 3, 3.6 tons of soybean in three, four years now, they are around 5, 5.5, almost 6 tons. Are the same or less, including. Uh, chemical fertilizer because there are more mycorrhiza, there are more uh, phosphorosolubilization with the root exudate, with the mycorrhiza, the effects the pseudomonas fluorescence and other uh, bacteria in all microorganisms specialize on that. And all these effects of the plants, the, the, the exudates of the plants and the tissue as well are promoting more equilibrium. So as more you are uh, uh, miming the, 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 the forest or the nature uh, is better, more biodiversity, more equilibrium, and you, all these farmers. You have a lot of results here in Paraná with the, the, the grain crops, with the maize, the soybean. Last Ademir. week, we are working on, we are also the, working with the sugar. Yes, please. How the dryness has affected uh, uh, your work there in, in Paraná? How what, excuse me? The dryness. Dryness. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, some region of Paraná was terrible. We lose some region. It was not uh, in all states. We have uh, the total area winter is summer is around uh, eight or nine million hectares, but we have around almost 5.5 5 .5 million hectares, 5.2 million hectares in this soybean. Uh, one part, it was uh, terrible with the dry condition. In another part now, uh, it's a sexy rainfall in the, the end of the cycle was uh, very, very terrible for the, for the, the soybean growers. Also sugarcane farmers, we are working exactly last week in Sao Paulo state, we have 500 hectares in a farmer. It was great in the, uh, 
a wonderful renewing sugarcane area with the mixed cover crops. You put their radish, crumby, sunflower, pyramid, uh, cowpea. Uh, it was wonderful. The result was perfect. So just now they are past the ninth ruler last weekend. In two, three weeks, they just opened the furrow and implanted the, the sugar cane. So a minimum or no till sugar cane. And together with the biological, together with the bioactivation products to increase the old microorganism in order to promote this balance. So it's more and more uh, also in bean uh, producers, soybean, all this crop, uh, peanut, is, is increasing a lot this we call the stripe with the cover crops mixing with the biological products together with the soil implant bioactivation and these are really working very nice uh, in the farmer that are doing this are are reaching good good results Keith, uh, are, are those concepts uh, similar to what uh, you have been working there Yeah, there, there definitely is increased interest in the biological products, you know, whether it be a, a compost extract or uh, some sort of a uh, growth stimulant, um, you know, whether, you know, seaweed, uh, worm castings, humates, things like that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of products on the market right now. I don't know that there's been necessarily a lot of testing done. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that people could try and, and somewhat mixed results. You know, some people are having fantastic results, uh, and others, you know, they don't see, you know, that, uh, as, as good a results. I don't think it's hurting them. They just don't see the big results. And, you know, that, you know, has a lot to do with the environment that it's put in, in the state of the soil. And, you know, there's probably a lot of things, uh, that factor into that. So I think there's a lot of interest in that. You know, we ourselves are really cutting back on the amount of fertility that we're putting, putting on our crops, you know, reducing the nitrogen use. Uh, and part of that is we're adding things to our liquid nitrogen, you know, molasses and sulfur and humates to, to make that more available to the plant, to make it less uh, volatile from, from uh, leaving. Um, and, and then uh, we're, we're using a lot of compost as well. We're making our own compost. Uh, here on our farm. We, we're not selling that. We're just using it for our own farming operation. Uh, but we're trying to put, you know, three, four tons of compost on all of our acres every year. And that makes a big difference as well. So I would say, yes, there's a lot of interest in the biologicals. A lot of the big ag companies are starting to getting into not only manufacturing them, but selling and promoting them. Uh, I think they've kind of waited around and seen that it's a, it's a trend that's not going to go away. And so now they're jumping in and wanting to be part of that market space. I mean, you know, just a, yes, just a comment. Uh, say to keep one thing that they also increase a lot of here is, for example, the free bacteria applying, for example, Azospirillum brasiliensis and also other species. But here in Brazil, 10 years of the study of the Federal Center of Research in Brapa, they got a wonderful results, like a 12 to 14 percent of the increased dry mass of the different grasses. And also increased 22 to 24% of the, the protein content of this biomass. So when you're using this uh, free bacteria, it says azospirillum is a free, it is a wonderful approach. It's a wonderful amount of nitrogen. It also endophytic go into the roots and also affects with the, the, the the hormones, cytosine and oxygen diverling, and also increase the root growth and also promote more resistance for the plants. So the results are fantastic. We are using this a lot of also in our mixed cover crops, very, very common, and also using in pasture and in a forage area and also different crops. And also together with the, 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 uh, the inoculant that you use in soybean, you know, brandy resorbium, We use quite a lot of different doses, uh, together with the, we call cow in inoculation, together with the azospirillum, the results are fantastic. We are also in Cerrado area, in Savannah area, we have a more dry area in Brazil, also are increasing the grain yield, the soybean and all the other crops, and also the, the performance of the pasture, the quality, and also increases soil organic matter, and also increases soil uh, microorganisms. So, 
is a wonderful also are increasing a lot of these use. Ademir, are you forecasting uh, more uh, areas of uh, cover crops in Brazil this year? Oh, yes. Are increase a lot. Last week, we talked about farmers, they use 1,600 hectares in different mix. It's incredible. So this is an increase year by year. We have no idea exactly, but we estimate maybe 12, more than 10, 12 million hectares in Brazil. But this year, we have this problem with the, the, the dry season and the results. So in many areas, with excessive salts or excessive chemical fertilizer and others, they are looking for this biodiversity. So the mixed cover crop is perfect. It's increased a lot. Quite a lot of uh, companies are selling, some of companies, but many farmers are using uh, isolated cover crop. But we, I don't recommend. The best cover crop is a mix. Which mix you use in different places, different plots, depend on the diagnosis. What we expect, how is the, the time, how is the, what you, you're looking for for the effects of this cover crop. If nematodes increase microbiology or recycle nutrients or whatever. So this is also increasing a lot in Brazil, yeah. Different place, also in Paraguay, also in Bolivia, the different countries are increasing a lot. Yes. yes. Keith, uh, we have uh, known for, from the USDA Ag Outlook that uh, the corn and soybean acres will be a record this year in the US. And do you think the cover crops will follow? A lot of that's going to depend on how the harvest goes. What we typically see, especially in those corn and soybean acres, is if the planting gets done at the normal time and we have a growing season that's somewhat normal so that harvest happens on schedule, then I think we will see some really good increased cover crop numbers, perhaps record numbers. If planting gets delayed, if it's a cool summer and the crop is delayed and harvest is late, uh, that's when we see a lot of people backing away from doing cover crops simply because they think they don't have enough time. Although we've seen, you know, time and time again that, you know, we can plant rye, you know, we can plant rye, you know, into December, you know, right in the heart of the winter and it's, it's going to be okay in the spring. So there, there's more time for people to plant cereal rye uh, than what they think. We just got to, we have to convince them uh, that they can do that. And even hairy vetch, you know, we've seen some pretty good results on late planted hairy vetch. It, it is not very big, you know, it takes a while to get going in the spring, but, but it's going to be there. And we had, we had some impressive results on some hairy vetch fields, uh, hairy vetch that we planted in the, in the previous year. And, and we let it grow. We had to be patient because this, this past year we had a cool spring, so it grew really slowly. And by about May 1st, you know, the hairy vetch was just, it was just barely there. And, and a lot of guys were planting corn, but we had one field that we waited on. And by June 1st, that hairy vetch had gone from, you know, very little uh, to about 8,000 pounds of dry matter and 180 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So that those last you know, 10 to 14 days, you know, that the biomass just exploded. And then we're able to roll that down and, and plant our crops right into that. Now we didn't do that on all of our acres. We just did that on kind of a trial because it, it did slow us down in planting. Uh, but, you know, in a more normal year, you know, we could maybe back that up and be planting May 20th. Uh, and that's, you know, that's pretty acceptable. So we're going to do more of that. We we planted almost all of our acres this year to hairy vetch, rye combination, different uh, different combinations, and we're going to try to let that grow as much as we're comfortable with this spring, and then roll it down and plant into it. So, you know, for the most part, the amount of cover crops that we'll get planted this fall is going to be highly dependent upon the harvest schedule. Okay, Ademir, your conclusions for uh, this conversation. Yeah, it's first, it's a great pleasure to talk with our friends for a long time, Keith, and also contact and talk with the American farmers is a, always a great pleasure with you. And say that, uh, unfortunately, we, we should be the, the CA World Congress in Switzerland, but with the problem with the pandemic, it will be not happen just uh, by video. But anyway, 
Brazil is here. We have some challenges, but we are increasing. We are increasing the use of plants. We are increasing the sustainable agriculture, looking for our friends American are doing in trying to do as, as better, as more as possible. And you are talking farmers at 30, 35 or more years. Eh? We just one, one and a half a month ago, we lost our great leader, great guru, Mr. Herbert Bartz, our friend, the father of Marie Bartz. He's a guru of uh, no-till in Latin America, but his uh, legacy uh, left to us to follow him and to use this principle of the CA, the conservation agriculture, the no-till with quality. So we're looking for that. And I hope that in a short time, we will overcome this pandemic and you'll be together visiting USA and receive all American kids and others here in Brazil. It will be a great pleasure to see our coffee in, in altitude, high quality, to see our sugar cane, our soybean, our beef cattle as well. It's a great pleasure. And big hugs and cheers. All the best to all farmers, all friends, American. Thank you. Give your final words. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity as well. And I would just encourage people, you know, it, it, it's been a really crazy year and, and 2021 will probably be equally as crazy, uh, you know, with, with COVID, with financial things, with, you know, government unrest, any number of different things, you know, low commodity prices, high commodity prices. I just want to really encourage people that in, in, in spite of all the things going on to, to really focus on the long term, you know, build build that soil, you know, for your children and for their grandchildren, because that's what's going to last, you know, COVID, you know, we're always going to have pandemics come and go, you know, financial things come and go, you know, but, but, but the land is permanent uh, as long as we can hold it in place. So I would just really encourage people, you know, in times of uncertainty to really go back to what they know and what they understand. And that's, that's the land and, and the health of the land and the importance of it. And, and to not get caught up in, in uh, you know, trying to capitalize on high prices of corn uh, exclusively, but, but to really take proactive steps to, to build that land and ensure the future viability, you know, for your children or for grandchildren or, or whoever is going to farm that next, because that's, that's really the lasting legacy that you'll leave. I really appreciate uh, both of you coming here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you.